an idea from the past. But we need all these ideas, we need all these concepts to actually begin to grasp the validity of current of, of today's dialects and the loss in variety and the loss in heterogeneity and the, the, the loss in that richness that we suffer every time we let an old dialect die. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No question answered before I commit to this. Okay. Also first you have not answered my real question. Is it Kikaro or Kisa or Sisa? No idea. We still have no idea how the language uh, was spoken Latin, uh, which was so many years. But then the other, the other thing is, I'm very grateful now that I can consider myself uh, as an inventor of a new uh, English. <laughs> I, I call it so far pigeon English, but maybe it's also already creolization. You know, German English, German English. That's that's great. And in fact, you know. Usually I do it exactly the other way around. Nicht? I ask my translator to uh, she's not here tonight, I think. <laughs> One of my most translators, to write in English out of my German text, which I cannot understand anymore. In that moment when I cannot not either pronounce, not understand the English, I think now my text is right. <laughs> I have no idea what she what she was saying, you know, somehow. <laughs> but, but, but thank you very much because it takes so much time, she is so slow. You know, <laughs> next time I will really write just my English that I understand my English it's the same way I teach in class, you know. It's certainly the grammar is wrong, the pronunciation is wrong, they say don't understand it, but according to you now it's living language. And okay, that's exactly <laughs> English. <laughs> right, that's very good. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, that was quite a quite a uh, educational talk you you gave us uh, tonight. And it's amazing that we really not considering this material forces. And that is the main thing you do all the years that you bring back back the thing we have to consider the material stuff and not the ideal things, they are not ruling what's going on, sondern it is how it is emerging, right? which is important, they're not our definitions. And certainly that is what you call it, <coughs> realism, and that is the kind of realism I can certainly share. You know, it's not a question of the world outside exists without me. Um, I don't know. My answer to that is I really don't know, because how can I know? <laughs> as long as I, I had to be dead to know. And then, Knowledge is that too. Okay, now question and answer, please. Yes, um, so uh, it's maybe more of a footnote than a question. So I think, you know, when we compare these different kind of historical linguistic schools, right, you know, Sassur, Lavrov, uh, uh, Chomsky, let's say, Fodor, you know, your linguistics, you know, your networks, I mean, maybe, maybe we should, perhaps we can also say that you know, it's a classical, like classical case of paradigm shifts, right? Where, like, when paradigm shifts, people actually start asking different questions, looking, you know, at, 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 right, at different topics. So one thing which, and again, I, I'm not sure it's completely correct because I think I saw some indications of it, but I don't remember exactly. So one thing about Chomsky, I mean, I think ultimately Chomsky I think, is concerned with a very different ideal language than, let's say, about people you're talking about. Because the context, right, in which his work emerges, it's a kind of early Cold War. And with this desire and massive funding made available in America, we have automatic computer translation programs, right, which would translate all the Russian scientific literature from Russian into English. So, so I think we just, I think we can intellectual and pragmatic justification of the universal grammar. What well, if there is this universal grammar, then of course we can build these automatic translation systems which is 70, 60 years later we don't have. So I think that's one of the reasons why Chomsky concerned himself with a kind of written language, and also that's why he can insist on the universal grammar, because if you believe in universal grammar, then, you know, yes, you could go and spend all this energy building these automatic computer translation systems, uh, which of course turns out to be much more difficult than we could follow in 50, 50, 50, 50. Now, you're absolutely right. He, in fact, is the father of automata theory, Beyond linguistics, he's the first one who classified the different automata from finite state automata to Turing machines uh, by their capacity to handle different types of language. 
So he's the first one who indicated that a finite state automaton can understand the mouse runs, but not the mouse the cat chases runs. Because a finite state automaton cannot put parentheses. And so how, how does it know that runs is supposed to go with the mouse? No. The mouse the cat chases runs. We immediately know that if the runs go with mouse and chases with cat, but he's the first one to point out that embedded clauses and, and of course more complex syntactical forms that we normally take for granted demand different machines to understand. And he's the first one who classified the, the machines by their computing power relative to how well they could handle uh, embedded clauses and double embedded clauses, you know, the mouse, the cat, the dog's bit chase runs, which I don't understand already, but certain machines can. And so you're absolutely right. The 50s, when he came up with these ideas first, were very much into that kind of thing, which continues today, by the way, because, you know, there was a, you know, it was a big panic when the internet first began, particularly when the web first began in 95, everybody thinking, oh my God, English is going to take over the world because every web page is in English. All the search engines are in English. English is going to, the internet is going to be what a compulsory education in the standard was for the standards. And thanks to mechanical translators, thanks to software that can translate one web page into another, now you can have pages in any language. And today you can go to Italian pages and they give you the choice. You want to see this in English or you want to see this in, 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 in Italian. And so the question continues to be alive, the question of mechanical translators. That mechanical translators are, in the way, the only thing that's stopping standard English from becoming the international standard, forcing everybody to read web pages in English. With a population of mechanical translators throughout the world, web pages can represent the real diversity of languages around the world. So this is still a very live issue. Nevertheless, I would insist that one of the things that was a problem is is not to go like uh, as Labov did with a tape recorder to get a, a sense of the variation, to get a sense of the heterogeneity and use yourself as an as informer. Right? Any anthropologist knows that you need to get a native of the culture you're studying as an informant. You can't use yourself as an informant. When you use yourself as an informant, you introduce all kinds of biases that are your own biases. So Labov, by saying, let's think of language in populational terms, which is the way Deleuze thinks about language, in populational terms, in multiplicities, in collectivities, and see how the variation is distributed, instead of trying to find out what is the same across everybody, which leads you to essentialism, and it leads you to think that there's an essence that everybody shares, as opposed to thinking in terms of heterogeneity, variation, difference, which is, of course, what Deleuze it shines uh, on doing. He's the B philosopher of difference.